The acid started to cause the, my, my inside to, to bleed. So I was vomiting a mixture of blood and body acids. And uh, all the time, my body was weakening. They died in vain because we didn't do enough to stop them dying. It was our fault that they died. Not only was the hunger strike a defeat, but the whole campaign of violence was a defeat. It was certainly not worth dying for, what has been brought about now. What we have here is a British solution to the Irish problem. Uh, we don't have an Irish solution to the Irish problem. On a bad day, I asked was, was it all worth it? Was it worth it? I come here every day for the last 20 years. I come here to pay my respects to my dead brother and the rest of the men that's buried here, but especially my brother. I would leave a wee flyer and I would stand here and say a few prayers. And I have to speak on his behalf. So guide me then as I'm speaking on his behalf. Let me say the words that he would want me to say about him. Mickey Devine was 27 years old when he died in the Mays prison on the 20th of August, 1981. He was the 10th and last man to die on hunger strike. 20 years on, the mural artists are keeping their memories alive. The 10 dead men have become Republican icons. Such a courageous feat in defense of uh, one of the biggest powers in the world. And uh, I mean, 20 years on, the legacy still stands. I mean, this is more of a tribute, it's not to try and remind any people. It's almost from a popular response that people are saying, do you know what's happening? We want to know. The kids are just lined up, wanting to know stories, did you know them? And if by fact you're lucky enough to have ever have known one of them, you know, it's almost sort of comes back. To you. you almost get some sort of respect from it as well. I, I saw them as the enemy, let's be blunt about it. And um, I thought I saw what they were doing as criminal in terms of uh, the number of ordinary innocent civilians who were being slaughtered. In 1976, the government introduced its criminalization policy, which meant that paramilitary prisoners were treated the same as everyone else. But Republican prisoners believed they were fighting a war and should therefore be treated as political prisoners. So this new policy sparked a series of protests in the prison. The inmates demanded five concessions, including the right to wear their own clothes. They refused to wear the prison uniform and instead wore no clothes at all. This was the blanket protest. Political prisoners! We want political status! By 1978, many of them escalated the protest. They smeared their excrement on the walls of their cells. Still, the government would not give in. 20 years on, it's hard to believe that these pristine cells once housed the horror and the filth of that time. The blanket protest and the dirty protest didn't work. The prisoners and the Republican movement needed a strategy which would win or at least defuse the prison's issue. And it was here in these cells that that strategy was devised. By 1980, serious talk was underway. The prisoners decided to use their most powerful weapon of protest, the hunger strike. On the 27th of October, 1980, seven men refused food. If the government didn't deliver their five demands, they were prepared to die very, very frightening uh, position to find oneself in, very cold and lonely position uh, to, to find oneself facing that reality. It's not at all easy and it's not at all easy to come to terms with, but the circumstances at the time were so unique, so awful in many ways that I, along with others, had ourselves steeled for that eventuality. 53 days later, this hunger strike was over. No one had died. The prisoners thought they had a deal, but they soon realized they could not accept what was on offer. They believed the government had gone back on its word. They began planning a second strike. It would be led by a 27-year-old IRA man, Bobby Sands. 
I saw him primarily as a terrorist. That's what I saw him as. And, and somebody who was engaged in a hunger strike, uh, which was itself had fanatical, in my opinion at that time, and still I think, had got elements of fanaticism about it, which I found extremely disturbing uh, and filled me with a considerable amount of dismay. Initially, the outside Republican leadership opposed the hunger strike. At the 11th hour, they appealed to the prisoners to reconsider. They would not. A Republican prisoner at the Mays Prison in Northern Ireland refused breakfast this morning and says he will fast to the death to achieve his aim of political status. I'd like to welcome everybody here today and say that for me, it's an honour and privilege to be here in Beachman today. For this Brendan McFarlane, who is now a member of Sinn Féin, was commanding officer of the IRA prisoners during the hunger strike. Throughout that time, they stayed in daily contact with the outside leadership. And will never be forgotten for giving them. They wrote on pieces of paper, which were smuggled in and out of the prison, often via a goodbye kiss. These notes were called comms. For security reasons, the prisoners used code names. Bobby Sands was known as Charlie. Charlie is in good form and is not as yet experiencing any weakness, dizziness, tiredness pains and nothing at all. He is not taking salt tablets, but has raw salt in his cell. The prisoners had a simple theory. They thought that the outside support which the hunger strike generated would be enough to force the government's hand. But the Prime Minister was not for turning. Crime is crime is crime. It is not political, it is crime and there can be no question of granting political status. But what if the prisoner was a member of parliament? Would that make a difference? The Republican movement and the wider nationalist community believed it would. The opportunity, a by-election. The constituency for Manor South Tyrone, the candidate, was Bobby Sands. It is perfectly clear that there are enough votes in this constituency to elect Bobby Sands. A lot of people voted for Bobby Sands because they thought if he got elected, it would save his life. People genuinely didn't believe that the British government would allow an MP to die. The other nationalist candidates stood aside to give Bobby Sands a free run. The Protestant community was shocked. I think they saw it almost as a, de as a declaration of war by the nationalist tradition against the unionist tradition. And that evoked a, a, a huge resentment. I, I would think that the hunger strike itself and the vote for Bobby Sands inculcated a degree of distrust that hadn't been, despite all the killings, hadn't been evident up until then. And I think that the, the, the echoes of that distrust uh, still linger. In, in the unionist community today. Sands, Bobby, anti H block, Armagh, political prisoner, 30,000. Yeah! Bobby Sands was elected despite an intensive IRA campaign of violence. Civilians and members of the security forces were being killed almost on a daily basis. Northern Ireland plunged to new depths of bitterness. One regular visitor to the maze was Father Dennis Fall. He supported the prisoners' demands, but abhorred the violence outside. It was the first time I saw Catholics hating the British and hating some of their Protestant neighbours. And that had to be stopped, of course, in the name of Christianity. Yes, and I noticed that was creeping in because the blame, it, was, it seemed so hopeless. Sixty-five days after he began his hunger strike, Bobby Sands died in the prison hospital. Comrade Moore, I just heard the news. I'm shattered. I just can't believe it. This is a terrible feeling I have. I don't even know what to say, comrade. I'm sorry, but I just can't say anything else. Outside the walls of the maze, the impact of Bobby Sands' death was immediate and violent. It was clear to anyone watching that this wasn't just another Republican protest. 
The massive crowd at Bobby Sands' funeral seemed to demonstrate a level of anger and support which united the Republican movement like never before. It hit very hard and people were devastated. But again, you know, that loss or that sense of loss or that uh, deep sense of hurt uh, was tempered by a determination to ensure that uh, we would carry through to the end what we had set out in the first instance. Bobby Sands' funeral sparked further violence on the streets. One of the, the, the events which stick out in my memory is that I think it was two days after Bobby Sands died that a milk lorry was stoned just down the Antrim Road from where I live and a young 14-year-old boy was killed in that accident whenever the, the, the milk lorry had a lamp post and then his father died a week later. And that is an indication of the level of, of fanaticism and division and anger which was occasioned by the hunger strike. Despite the violence, nationalists were united in their opposition to the government's handling of the hunger strike. People across the world also made their views clear. But it made no difference to Margaret Thatcher. She believed the Catholic community was being blackmailed by Republicans. They seek to work on the most basic of human emotions, pity, as a means of creating tension and stoking the fires of bitterness and hatred. In doing so, the provisional IRA have put the Catholic community on the rack. We thought she was dreadful, that she was, she was completely unsympathetic. Completely de she didn't understand the personal sorrows, the, the, she didn't understand the prison problems, and she, she uh, didn't understand the political problems. Inside the prison hospital, more deaths. Outside the walls, one funeral after another. Francis Hughes, Raymond McCreesh, Patsy O'Hara, but the prisoners would not back down. Such a bastard of a day. What I want to do right now is kneel down and cry myself to death. Almost as soon as the hunger strike began, discussions were taking place in private and public to end it. In July, Gerry Adams, who was negotiating directly with a Foreign Office official, went into the maze to brief the prisoners about what was on offer. They didn't think it was enough, but the remaining hunger strikers were getting weaker. Kevin Lynch's family wanted to take their son off. I went to see the parents, particularly uh, Mrs Lynch in Dungiven, who was a very saintly woman and a woman I greatly admired, and she said, can nothing be done? Can you do nothing? to stop them on Kevin to live. The families had the right to ask for medical intervention once their loved ones became unconscious, but all of the hunger strikers had made it clear to their families that they wanted to continue their fast, and many relatives, including Mrs Lynch, felt they could not ignore their pleas. However, others could not watch their son or brother die. The pressures that were put on these families was immense, and some of the families intervened and that's their choice and we respect their choice and we understand the immense pressure that they were under but the manner in which people like Father Fall intervened there was despicable. I put that blame solely, solely on Margaret Thatcher because I knew she would have let 110 men die. Now that much you could say about Maggie Thatcher but what I would like to state about her is that the day she dies, that they can close the gates of hell and say, hell is full. She believed absolutely fundamentally that there was no political cause which condoned murder. She took this view everywhere in the world, in the Middle East, as well as in Northern Ireland, that you did not give in to, to, to terrorism or to violence or even picket line violence with the miners, if you like. I mean, any sort of violence she felt that you did not negotiate with. The family's intervention marked the beginning of the end of the protest. The prisoners began to lose control of it. Almost seven months and ten deaths later, the hunger strike was called off. I then headed for the hospital and saw all the hunger strikers together and covered all the points with them. They got a sound breakdown on the situation and agreed to a man that the intended course of action was our only option. The day the last hunger striker, Mickey Devine, died, Republicans were claiming another victory. Bobby Sands' election agent, Owen Caron, won the Fermanagh South Tyrone by-election. 
So in just four months, the Republican movement had discovered a new weapon, the ballot box. Up until that summer, they had refused to take part in any elections. So from 1979, where they're totally opposed to elections, to the summer of 1981, when they wanted to stand in every election, uh, everywhere, the Republic, the North, they stood in the Republic in 1982. So it was the hunger strike elections and the vote they got which absolutely galvanised them. They really knew they had a substantial electorate out there. Sinn Féin's political strategy was gaining momentum. Two years after the hunger strike, Gerry Adams won a Westminster seat in West Belfast. Their political transformation continued. In 1994, the IRA declared an end to its military operations. Three years later, Sinn Féin signed up to the Mitchell principles of non-violence, and then in 1998, they gave their backing to the Good Friday Agreement. Since then, two senior members, Martin McGuinness and Barbara de Bruyne, became ministers in a new Stormont government. The Republican movement in Northern Ireland now had a political power which it had never before known. The political strategy which Sinn Féin has developed over the past 20 years is supported by most people in the Republican movement. But others are questioning whether this process will ever lead to an actual British withdrawal from Ireland. They include Republicans who were once willing to fight and die for their cause. Some former hunger strikers as well as relatives of the 10 dead men who saw the 1981 protest as very much part of the wider armed struggle. They're now asking if Sinn Féin can sit in government at Stormont, was their war worth fighting, and was it worth the deaths of their ten comrades? And I would answer that I can't answer for, for, for the ten men who died. I can answer for me uh, and say that if I had died uh, during that hunger strike period and was able to look back now at what has been brought about, what the struggle was all about, uh, I certainly would say uh, I, I, I died in vain. It was certainly not worth dying for. Brendan Hughes, seen here with his old comrade Jerry Adams, was prepared to die on hunger strike for his Republican beliefs. But 20 years later, he sees a very different Republican movement from the one he joined in the 1970s, a movement he now feels he cannot support. Last October, he helped carry the coffin of Joseph O'Connor, a member of the real IRA, which violently opposes the peace process. Joseph O'Connor's death brought the divisions within republicanism out into the open. The provisional IRA said it didn't kill him, but the O'Connor family is convinced it did. So was former hunger striker Marion Price. Volunteer Joe O'Connor was clear in his opposition to British rule. He did not dissent from republican principles or ideals. He refused to accept British rule under any guise, irrespective of who, of who administered it, whether it be Peter Mandelson, David Trimble or Martin McGuinness. I never envisaged this. I certainly didn't go to prison for this. I certainly didn't join the IRA for this uh, and struggle uh, my life for this. Uh, to me, this is a, a total sellout of of everything Republican, every principle, every ideal. Uh, it doesn't matter who's sitting in Stormont. Stormont is unacceptable to Republicans because it's a British administration in a part of Ireland. Well, we would dispute that we're administering British rule in Ireland. We are in a transition towards the objective of an Irish Republic. And we're people in struggle. So as people in struggle, we have the right to take uh, decisions about how that struggle is conducted. And if other Republicans have a, have a view opposite to ours, well, they're entitled to that. They're entitled to that. What I would take issue with is that they don't have to have the hard word or the harsh word or the, or, or the cutting edge or the vitriolic uh, sort of pose that they sometimes take up in these, these, these matters. They seem to be more fixated with attacking other Republicans than they are about actually tackling the root cause of the problem in Ireland, which is the British involvement and the British uh, connection. The security force presence provokes a hostile reaction from all Republicans, and opponents of Sinn Féin's strategy fear that regardless of whether this process works, there will always be a British presence here. Those opponents are a minority. 
but Republican leaders are sensitive to their criticism. Two weeks ago, at a commemoration ceremony in the heart of South Armagh, one of the most senior figures in the movement addressed the issue directly. Brian Keenan is the IRA's link with John de Chastelin's decommissioning body. Don't be afraid of the phase we're in. That phase will either be successful or it will be over. The Good Friday Agreement will either stand or it will fall. Those who say the war is over, I don't know what they're talking about. What war? The revolution can never be over until we have our country, until we have British imperialism where they belong in the dustbin of history. Some Republicans aren't prepared to wait. While the provisional IRA says it will renew talks about decommissioning its weapons, the real IRA has been putting its own to use. Both it and the continuity IRA have carried out a series of bomb attacks since the provisionals called their ceasefire. The security forces believe they are growing in numbers. Their use of violence gets a mixed response from those who oppose the political process. Some condemn it, some support it. I think if the British give a declaration of intent to try, even if it's 10, 20 years down the line, that removes uh, the arms out of Ireland. It removes the, the reason for fighting the war. But as long as the, the partition of Ireland remains, there will be people prepared to, to fight. And I would not condemn them. I would not condemn them as long as the border remains. Republicans have always viewed the government's involvement here as the main cause of the conflict. In 1981, the prisoners used the hunger strike as a weapon against that involvement. But now some of their families are asking what was the point of it all. Mickey Devine was jailed for possessing weapons in 1977. His sister imagines a future her brother never lived to see. On a good day, I see a 47-year-old man sitting with his four grandchildren. And I wonder what it was all about. And on a bad day, I asked, was, was it all worth it? My brother's politics and mine were always completely different. But I think if he could pop his head out of this grave at the moment, he would say, no, no, go back to bar. Because he would think that maybe, possibly, that that wasn't what he died for. Critics of Sinn Féin say the party should have walked away when it became clear that a united Ireland was not up for negotiation. Marion Price believes that by signing up to the Good Friday Agreement, Gerry Adams and Martin McGuinness have betrayed the Republican cause. I see them as collaborators. They have sold out, totally. They are collaborators with the enemy. They are upholding British rule in Ireland. Martin McGuinness is a British minister. Now, he may not like to be told that, but that is a fact. Lawrence McKeown spent 70 days on hunger strike before his family intervened. He's a strong supporter of Sinn Féin's involvement in the peace process and believes it's a continuation of the struggle. If it's Irish people in Ireland trying to develop policies within the context of, of current realities, uh, then I would prefer that Martin McKinnon or whoever else in Sinn Féin is in there making those policies. Uh, I don't think that Martin McGuinness or Barbara de Bruin or, or anyone else who's there sees that as the end goal. It's impossible to say how the hunger strikers would have reacted to Sinn Féin sitting in a Stormont government. But for the family of Bobby Sands, it represents betrayal. The Bobby Sands Trust is the legal owner of his prison writings. This is its website. Prominent Sinn Féin members sit on its board. Two members of the Sands family resigned from the board. The family declined to be interviewed by Spotlight. But in a letter to a newspaper last year, they said the ideals for which their brother died had been abandoned. Well, I'm not going to try, try and second guess uh, Bobby Sands. Uh, I know him very well. Uh, I have a notion of where his head was on a lot of these uh, issues. And for anyone to use the dead in the emotive way that it has been used, that, that Bobby's name has been used, I think is just sad. The hunger strike, which 20 years ago galvanized and united the Republican movement, is now the focus for deep divisions within Republican ranks. Sinn Féin's involvement in hunger strike commemoration ceremonies has provoked anger from some of those opposed to their strategy. I think it's an affront to their memory. I think it's, it's downright blasphemy. 
I think the hypocrisy of them is unforgivable. Why? Because they have sold out everything those men died for, and yet they try, they try to hang on to their name. They try to sell the the image that the hunger strikers would have gone along with all this. But the fact is that what they achieved was the setting of an example. Delegates to a Sinn Féin meeting in Dublin at the weekend heard repeated references to the 10 dead hunger strikers. The party's critics say Sinn Féin is using the men to promote the Republican cause as it prepares for a spring general election. The party is planning to stand candidates in all 18 constituencies. Brendan Hughes says Sinn Féin is exploiting the dead hunger strikers to get votes. Uh, by using a platform and bringing people onto the street uh, to commemorate the 10 men who died and then to encourage people to go to an election booth to vote for a particular party. That is using the 10 men dead. What we are doing in the 20th anniversary of the hunger strikers is both a commemoration and a celebration of the lives of those people who laid down their lives so that we could have progress in this country and so that the British could not undermine or do major damage to that struggle. And that's what those men laid their lives down for, to prevent the British doing damage to the struggle. And Sinn Féin or the Republican movement would never consider manipulating that sacrifice for that. Twenty years on, the Mays prison is deserted, but the impact of what happened there will never be forgotten by Republicans. However, given the divisions within Republicanism, the legacy of the 1981 hunger strike may continue to be in doubt. Even among some families, the answer isn't always clear. There are nights I lie in bed and I have nightmares of being in that prison hospital and saying, did I do the right thing? I don't know. I like to think of that because I carried out his wishes. And as I say, I had no, I didn't think I had the right to sign any papers because before he went unconscious, he was still telling me, don't sign, don't sign. This is what I want to do. And I did it. It's 20 years on. I don't know if it happened this week, last week, what I would do in them circumstances again.